Hello everybody, it's Joe and welcome back to the workbench. As usual, I am so happy you guys are here. So today, this is the project that we're going to be working on, but first I need to tell you that I need your help with something. And I'll tell you more about that at the end of the video, so stay tuned for that. Let's get on to this project. This was on the Khan Engineering blog, which if you don't know who Khan Academy is, and don't support them in everything that they do, you should, and you should, because Khan Academy is awesome. So, on my birthday, they posted this, somebody brought in a diabolically evil wood puzzle that had an easy side and a hard side, and it was just four little pieces, and it was so difficult. And they got the easy side easy enough, but the hard side they couldn't get, and then drove them so crazy that they built computer solvers to try and run through every iteration of the solution and determine that it wasn't solvable by the computer. But it is in fact solvable and I knew, they didn't say in the blog how it solved, but I knew how it worked because I had seen a similar puzzle before that was just uh, four simple T's. I'll, I'll show you that one in just a little bit, but I want to, as soon as I saw this I was like, I have to have one of these, so I'm going to 3D print it because I can. And the problem is, this one uses a triangular grid, and Blender doesn't have a triangular grid, but I'm going to show you how to make that happen. So, let's open up Blender, let's take a look at that, and uh, yeah, get going on that. So, to start with, Blender, uh, Blender does have a grid object. Now, this grid object you can't see it even if you go into wireframe mode but it's actually not just a plane it's divided uh, well 10 by 2 times why is it 2 I must have added a grid earlier and had it set to 2 for some reason normally it's 10 by 10 not 210 10 by 10 uh, but again you can't see that unless you go into edit mode and then you'll see hey it's got 10 by 10 now, it's not 10 squares, it's 10 lines. So actually, if you want it to go evenly on the up and down, you need to make that an odd division. But again, this isn't a triangular grid. We need to make it a triangular grid. And so here's how I'm going to do it. First of all, let's get rid of that grid object. Let's add another grid object. But this grid object will have it be uh, 10 in the X, but 1 in the Y. Why are you doing? Oh, because you have to do two because it's top and bottom. Uh, so if we go into edit mode here, we'll see that this is divided ten times this way. To make it uh, those so that those are squares, we need this to be. Uh, well, we need it to be twenty in the y and two in the x. So let's see if that made it uh, square. And those are not quite squares, because if they were squares, that would line up. Uh, what? Where did I go wrong? Oh, I see it now. Uh, there there are only nine squares, and I need them each to be two. So it's not 20 across, it needs to be 18 across. So, whoops, I have no idea how I did that. I am fat fingering all over the place here, but in edit mode, there we go. Perfect, perfect uh, squares. Not triangles. So. We're just going to triangulate that, and now they're triangles, but they're not perfect triangles. In order to do that, we're going to take advantage of a very cool trick in Blender. We're going to grab these vertical edges, making sure that we're not that they're not connected, that they're all separate. Okay, and then we're going to change the pivot point to be individual origins. This means that if I scale them or if I rotate them every unique pocket of objects gets scaled or rotated together and since they're all a bunch of unique if I rotate these they all rotate individually. Isn't that cool? So if I just type in 30 degrees for my rotation we have perfect triangles all the way across. Ta-da! Now we need to stack them and to do that we're going to use an array modifier. We're going to go out of edit mode throw an array modifier on there now the cool thing about the array modifier, you'll notice that this copy has a gap between it. The reason why it has a gap is because the array modifier kind of puts a bounding box around things and so the one 
means that the bounding boxes are next to each other. Now that can be good and bad. When you're arranging prints for 3D printing, that gap is good. But when you're trying to do something where you want to flush up against each other, that might not be preferable. In this case, it actually works because we want to stack them in the Y direction. So uh, zero for the X and one for the Y. And then we'll just pump that up, I don't know, six times, seven times. We'll do it seven times. And now if we go into edit mode, well, let's apply that modifier. Now if we go into edit mode, we'll see that while they're all triangular, they're all stacked on top of each other, they're not a triangular grid. A triangular grid needs to go opposite each way. Well, once again, we can take advantage of those individual origin or individual pivot points. I'm just going to grab every other one of these, one point on them, expand the selection. The array modifier does not merge points. And then all we need to do is just rotate them. Now, if we rotated them like this and rotated them 180 degrees, we wouldn't see any change because they are rotationally symmetrical. However, if we rotate them around the, uh, the Y, there we go, we get what we're looking for. So we kind of flip them upside down. And now if we select them all and uh, remove the doubles, they are the perfect little grid. We're good to go. Now there's a problem though. If you go out of, of wireframe mode, you see how it kind of looks like it's corrugated, even though it really is flat, perfectly flat. Why are we doing why are we getting that? Well, each one of those triangles in in 3D design uh, has what's called a normal, a direction that it's pointing. And when we took them all and flipped them upside down, half of their normals are pointing down and half of them are pointing up. Fortunately, that's easy to fix. All you have to do is go to UV shading, tell it to recalculate. Now they're all the same direction. This side's light and this side's dark and everything's the way it should be. So now that we've got this, we can really easily uh, start building the parts that we want to see. I'm going to look over on the website to reference it. And there's one part that has, I'll just circle select this, PC looks like this, uh, just like that. So I'll duplicate those faces, separate by loose parts, select them all, extrude them by one, most everything's by two, so that, yeah, that looks pretty darn good. That's about what I'm looking for right there. And there's one piece. I'll go back to the grid. I'll make sure they're both selected so when I go into edit mode I can see them. Uh, we have another piece. I might have, yeah, I might not be able to do this the way I was planning on it. We'll do it like this. Um, it goes here and here. It goes up there. And it goes over there. Perfect. So we'll separate, or duplicate those points, separate them by loose parts, select them all, extrude by one. Now here's the problem that we have, okay? Uh, if we want these pieces to nestle into each other perfectly when we 3D print them, we have a little problem. And that problem is that their geometry is perfectly matched. What there's no gap between them in the geometry, which means if you're over extruding just a little bit, or if your slicer doesn't shrink it just a little bit to be inside of it, or if just it it will be too tight. We need to create a gap between them, so we need to kind of shrink them. That's not to say that we need to scale them down. We need them to shrink in on themselves. Unfortunately, there's an easy way to do that in Blender. So all we have to do is add a solidify modifier. Now I've used a solidify modifier in the past to take a flat object and make it solid. Well now I'm taking a solid object and making it solider. Now what I'm doing, if you take a look, I'll just uh, thicken this a little bit. Uh, why are you, why are you, my computer is really suffering today. Whoops, that's way too much. There we go. So if you do this, what it does is it kind of creates a shape inside the shape. Now, there's a little bit of a problem here. The problem that we have right now is that these shapes are not their final size. Here, let me let me give you some reference here. I've got an object that I've uh, loaded in. This, this cube here represents the build area of my 3D printer. 
uh, which is a little bit on the large side, not the largest build area, but nevertheless, I know how big this is, so if I just turn this to wireframe, I can see that while this part is sitting on my build platform, it's teeny tiny. I need to scale these up. So I'm going to grab, I'll grab all of these and scale them up by, oh, I don't know, five? Yeah, five times scale up looks pretty darn good. So that's, that's pretty good. Now I need to apply that scale there. Oh, they were all scaled by their individual origin, so they didn't, ha, that's funny. I have forgotten to change that. They didn't scale relative to each other, they scaled relative to their own size. So there we go, I got them more or less in the same place, enough that it'll demonstrate the point. And now I'm going to shrink them by adding that solidify modifier. And I want the gap between them to be somewhere between 0.1 and 0.2 millimeters. I'll maybe do a 0.15. It uh, doesn't look like a whole much, but also I want to flip the normals, use even thickness and high quality normals. Uh, let me turn up the size here so you can see what happens if I do that. You know what? I'll, I'll just say experiment with that. that. That's left as an exercise to the reader. But flipping the normals, now the outside one is negative. Let me show you why we do that. Apply that modifier, separate by loose parts, grab the outside one, just the outside one, and delete it. And now the inside one's normal is correct. You know, I need to add some color to this so that we can see it. Uh, you know what, I'll just add color to this so that we can see it relative to... There we go. There we go. Now I need to take this guy right here, add the solidify modifier to him. Uh, 0.15 as well. Flip normals, even thickness, high quality normals, apply. Separate by loose parts and delete the outside shell. And there we go. Now they've got a little gap between them so that when they print, they won't be so tight that they won't interact very nicely. And that's how you do that in Blender. Now I'm not gonna make you sit here and watch me do this whole thing. I am gonna say, here's, here's the other puzzle that I have. See a bunch of T's and there's two sides to this one as well. I'll just uh, enter and exit edit mode so that that clears up. So this one, the pieces fit uh, in this, in this well, actually, that's the hard side. The easy side looks like this, and it's fairly easy to figure this one out. The problem kind of lends itself to the solution, and then you go, ha, 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 you think you're smart, and you flip it over, and there's this slightly smaller rectangle or, or square that the old solution doesn't fit in anymore. So I've already prepared these puzzles ahead of time. Uh, this is the T puzzle. Oh, let me let me pull up my camera so I can make sure I can see what you you guys can see. Uh, this is the T puzzle, so there's the the easy side. Uh, four T's right there, sorry about that noise. Um, and then you flip it over and there's the hard side. Oh, And you kind of have to think outside the box, well, no, you have to think entirely inside the box to solve this one, but you have to, I don't want to give it away. You should go find this one. The download links are available wherever links are found. And then here is is the uh, is the triangular one and as I said the parts interact with each other absolutely whoops absolutely perfectly so they they meet and they mate and they slide and they don't you know they're not too tight it's absolutely perfect and it's got the easy side and it's got the hard side so there we go guys uh, that is how you design puzzles and design them with enough tolerance that they can print well. So I said at the beginning of this video that I need your help, and I do. What I need your help with is I'm getting dangerously close to 500 subscribers, which is a mind blow for me. You guys are the wind beneath my wings. Thank you so much for watching and, and sharing and liking and subscribing. Simon's down there to remind you to do all those things. Now, a while ago, I said that when I get to 500 subscribers, I'm going to do something, something. And I didn't know what it was at the time, and I still don't know what it is. I need your help to help me decide 
what am I going to do for my 500 subscriber celebration? I'd like it to be some big project that I wouldn't normally do, but really, I'd like it to be something you guys would like to see. So, in the comments, if you've got a project that you'd like to see made real, then go ahead and leave a comment. And if you're looking through the comments and see something that somebody else said that it might not be your idea, but hey, it'd be pretty cool to see anyways, thumb that one up. And I'll take those thumbs up and whatever into account as I decide what to do when I hit 500 subscribers. Thank you all for watching. And uh, again, leave that comment so we know what to do. I'll see you next time when I might have 500 subscribers. <laughs> oh, wow.